AppSec USA here in Denver, Colorado. It's been a long week. I hope you've had a successful conference. Uh, there's been a lot of great talks. I hope this is one that you'll enjoy. Um, OWASP A9, a year later, are you still using components with known vulnerabilities? Um, it, it, I think it's interesting for me to take a retrospective at looking at OWASP A9. Those of you that aren't familiar with it, um, you know, I, I am not a huge fan of referring it to as A9 because you know, I know that there's a top 10, but I probably couldn't name what's number three, number four, number six, number seven. Um, A9 is really was introduced last year um, when we looked at the fact that we're realizing that the way we build software is really sort of fundamentally changing. It, and I say that because we build less and less and we assemble more and more. We have very little insight into what's truly in our software. And I don't say this lightly you, because you know, I'm a developer myself, or I sometimes pretend that I'm a developer. I don't get to develop that much anymore. Um, every time I try and develop something, someone tells me you should be on a plane someplace. Uh, so, so I don't get to write as much as, as I used to, but software has gotten so complex, even in the software that I used to understand how it worked that now I look at the average application and there's very little that we truly understand what's in there. I look at components as almost like, it's like the crack cocaine of software development. We can't get people off of it, All right? The train has already left the station. Developers, are, are lo they can't get enough of it. Oh, I need to do logging? I need log4j. Oh no, log4j is no longer good, I need log back. Oh, I need a new framework. Which one should I pick? Should it be Struts? Should it be Stripes? Should it be uh, Spring? Should it be uh, Drop Wizard? Uh, oh, Drop Wizard. Should I use Tomcat? Should I use Jetty? Should I use oh, XML? No, should I use JSON? Or, no, should I use a compressed JSON? Oh, oh, there's just so many choices, and developers want to choose them all. And oftentimes, they are all in your application. I wrote a white paper several years ago about dependency injection um, in Spring. And I mapped out the request of when a user types something into a web application, by the time it gets to what the developer thinks is their application, how much other code did it go through in the Spring library? And I threw it up in a, I think it was like an OWASP session in New York. I threw up the dialog box of, here's the control structure of a web request through Spring. How many people use Spring? Lots of hands go up. All right. How many people understand that this is what Spring does in your app? Nobody has any clue. But they can't get themselves off the fact that I'm going to leverage these components. So not only are we still using components with known vulnerabilities, but we really don't even know what's in our software anymore. And we really should begin to sort of wake up to the fact that we are getting less and less visibility as we add more and more features of what's truly happening in our software. You know, the reason why we have AppSec conferences, the reason why AppSec is one of the, grow, you know, the fastest growing software businesses is the fact that things are getting comp more and more complex. I, mean, I don't know if any of you saw the, the talk yesterday on the, uh, on the top 10 hacks of uh, 2013, right? I mean, I, 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 I look at that, I'm like, oh, yeah, we've got no hope, right? There's some guy who's going to spend his, his next six months figuring out, oh, if I blink this image and I do it this way, I can subvert this technology that nobody knows how it works in the first place. Um, you know, it's like we, we think we got rid of these attacks or these vulnerabilities and they get, keep reappearing. I thought that we got rid of, you know, dependency injection, but we keep adding. I did a search um, uh, when I first started at Sonartype, I did a search for web frameworks, right? What are, what are web frameworks? So I did a basic Google search. Uh, I want to write a new web 2.0 application, so what should I use? Right? Of course, it takes me to Stack Overflow. And it's like, oh, no, you should use, you should use uh, um, sp uh, Spring. No, you should use Stripes. Anyway, I heard a couple of my friends are using Drop Wizard. Another guy's like, oh, no, Stripes is the latest, coolest thing. Well, the problem is, is that each one of those reintroduces the same things that were learned from the previous framework. So it's this never-ending battle. So one of the things that we did is to sort of put this in context of of we announced A9, or A9 gets announced as part of OWASP last, last year, and have we begun to move the needle at all? 
Um, so we, we have a survey that we uh, go out, it goes out about 3,300 different developers that ask them a bunch of different questions. And I wanted to use that framework of that discussion to sort of talk about, are we moving the needle at all? Um, the interesting th uh, thing about here is, I mean, there's a lot of stats, some of these I'll, I'll drill in a little more detail, is that we have increased awareness, but there still is that general state of apathy. Oh, it's this thing? Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I'm kind of concerned. Yeah, that's a tomorrow's problem. The reality is, is that, you know, if you don't know what's in your software, it's a today's problem. And if you don't realize that you're using open source and what's, what open source you're using and that you should have a, a means to an end of being able to understand how you actually build software, you are not going to be able to move that needle. You'll be playing whack-a-mole, right? We've been, I mean, I built the static analysis tool. I, I love static analysis for a certain type of thing. I've, I, I've done pen testing. I like dynamic analysis. I like a lot of security techniques, but realize that those things are point solutions that are often way far in the, in, 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 in the, in later in your development cycle, and we still haven't sort of created a better hygienic development process in the first place. Um, you know, it's like I look at software and even software that I've developed and realize, that, you know, at the end, it gets close to release and you're happy about the features, but you feel kind of dirty about how you got there. It's like, oh, well, it works, but yeah, it works. I remember I was doing a review for a, a company and we, a security review, and we were asking them, you know, hey, can we get a, a copy of a control matrix so we could do author, uh, authentication authorization, right? And there wasn't a copy of the control matrix, right? So we don't really not understand what's in our software and we d we're really playing whack-a-mole at the end. And part of it is, you know, we really have changed. I mean, these are old numbers, right? I, I, was, to I was talking to our CFO the other day because I, I look at numbers all day long. I look at stats. I, I do analysis on our, on our data set, and I was telling our CFO, I said, I dream of numbers. He said, I've got a job for you. I said, no, I don't need those numbers. But, you know, Central, for those of you that don't know, so Central is the place where Java components live. So as we move into the next era of software development, we're finding that these, you know, we're finding places where we want to go and get our software some, from some known place. Right, so this central was really one of the very first binary repositories, and it was built for to solve a different purpose. Back when, when, when Maven was first created, it was attempting to solve a problem with just building open source software. So Jason Van Ziel, who founded Maven, was trying to solve a problem that every time he wanted to use some new piece of open source software, he had to go find its website, go to its website, download its source code, go back to the website, look at its build instructions, get about a page into it and say, oh, you know, I'm just gonna type, you know, ant make. Okay, that didn't really work because back then it was like, oh, well, you need to get this other piece of software. So you'd have to go back to the website, go back, find out, download, and it was ad nauseum, ad nauseum, having to go back to build something. Like, I just wanted to use this library. I didn't really need to understand how it built. So he created this dependency resolution system, which is now what all modern package managers use, right? A some sort of dependency ma um, resolution. So you want to use this library, but this library, in order to use this library, it depends on all these other things. You don't want to have to go figure out how, how those things come to, to come to be. You don't want to understand what, how they build. You just want them because you want to use this thing. So Maven d resolves those dependencies. Well, in building that, it's like, well, we need a place for these dependencies to live so that when, you, when your build goes to request them, they can come from someplace. So that's where Maven Central came from. And if you look at its, its growth rate, it's exponential. You know, there were, you know, there was, when it started, when, when we first started tracking in 2007, um, there was, you know, a few thousand components. Now, we, now we're up to around 600,000 different components in Maven Central, and that's one repository. Now you look at NPM and the growth rate of NPM and Node, right? We see a similar tra tra trajectory there, 
where we're also doing some work with Microsoft and NuGet. We see another trajectory there. All these ecosystems are realizing, even Docker, right? Like, oh, we should have these repositories of packages so that when people want to use something, they can say, oh, here, where do I go get it? Well, I don't have to go figure out how to use this thing. I just want to type a command, and lo and behold, it comes. Well, that's, that's when you think of it, that's almost like a, a scary thought that we've allowed this to go so far without thinking twice about, oh, wait a minute, where is this stuff really coming from and what is it? I know, and I'm still kind of scared because I know that all right, I, you know, people joke about when you use Maven that it downloads the internet, right? Well, we can laugh that it downloads the internet, but guess what? That's what's in your software. It didn't even just download the internet, it put it in your code. Right, so the joke isn't so much that it downloaded the internet. The joke is, hey, guess what? That's, that's really what's in your software. And we kind of ignore the fact that it, the train has sort of already left the station. Now, this isn't a bash on open source either because I love open source. You know, I think the open source movement has created a lot of things. We wouldn't have a dupe. Tomcat, Jetty, Log4J. I mean, the, 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 the packages and the innovation go on and on and on and on. So we can't, this isn't to say, oh, well, open source is bad. It's not. It's essential. That's the key thing here. It's that open source is essential. We were talking to one bank um, in, in uh, overseas. And when we were, we were, we do a bunch of different stuff. But we were giving a report saying, hey, guess what? Here's all the open source that you use. And here's some stuff that uh, you might not want to use. And the CEO was like, when did we start using all this open source? Because they think of open source as MySQL, like, oh, well, we use Oracle, you know, or Linux, well, we're a Microsoft shop. Um, and they're like, well, well, when did we start using all this open source? Well, all right, we're just going to stop using it. The VP of engineering says, uh, well, I uh, just want to let you know that if you want to stop using open source, then I'm not going to be your VP of engineering anymore. Because we don't have a business if we're not using open source. Um, even in Java, right? I, I, I joke sometimes. They're like, "Oh, well, we don't use you know we don't use a lot of open source libraries." I says, "Well, do you use Java?" And they say, "Well, yeah, we use some Java. Java's open source." Just letting you know, little cat out of the bag. You know, it's, <laughs> Java's open source. Now, the interesting thing is, when we first ran this survey, right? Heartbleed was you know one of those moments where a large part of the world woke up to the fact that, oh, I'm using this open source, and now I've got this problem. It was, like, you know, the, the, it was faster than when, I mean, I remember when Dan Kaminsky announced the DN, DNS rebinding attacks, and he, he threw the map up. I think it was RSA, maybe it was Black Hat. Threw up the map of how fast people patched. You know, like you could see it going over the world. Heartbleed was faster. I mean, we were literally like that fast. Four the most part. Heartbleed has a very long tail because a lot of people don't even know still whether they're really using OpenSSL and where they're using it, especially when you talk about embedded systems, manufacturing. Um, you know, is it really, am I really vulnerable to this? It, it, there is still a long tail. We've been doing some, I've been doing some research on mean time to repair, how long it takes organizations, in this case, open source projects, to notice the fact that they're using something that has a vulnerability and then actually patch. Um, and it's really, I'm getting some really interesting stats that on average, it takes the average open source project, this is open source, to one, realize that they're using something that's vulnerable and then patch that. It takes on average 391 days for, for that one open source project to realize that it's first level dependency has a vulnerability. Now, when you think of that, these dependency graphs get very large, very quickly. That we, I've seen cases where it's years before it gets patched. And I've got some other slides in here that talk about some, some of my favorite types of components. Um, some of them haven't been updated at all, ever. Right? Even though even though it was an awareness, people were all actually saying, oh yes, this is something that I'm actually being vulnerable to. I now realize that open source software can expose my organization. You know, I, but do they really care? 
I mean, I, I, could, I could probably say this about security in general, right? It's at a security conference. So I, oftentimes I, at a security conference, we all care, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But for the most part, we really don't. Right? Don't tell anybody, but we really don't care, right? Because you say, oh yeah, even though, right, we, we, we know we're being exploited, we've had incidents, right? Do we actually have a policy? Oh, uh, well, maybe. Well, if we have a policy, do we ever say that you can't use these particular components? Um, well, no. So to me, these, these things don't match, right? We think it's important. We know that it, it introduces a level of exposure or risk, but yet we don't have the ability to say there are things that we just shouldn't use as an organization, just shouldn't use. I remember when I was doing static analysis in C and C++, I used to say, get S, don't use it. People were like, oh, well, you know, and then no. It's like one of those things, you just, you just don't use it. There's no good reason to use that library. Well, we have the same thing, right? No longer is it a single method call. There are libraries We're like, hey, guess what? Don't use it. One of, one of my examples in here, I get, hey, this library is 10 years old. And it hasn't been updated in 10 years. Do you think you should be using it? I don't care how great you think it is, right? Do you think there might be a better choice for you? We, t we often think about our own technical debt. We worry about the technical debt of our software that we write. But the software that we write depends on other software. What about that debt? It has its own debt calendar that we just completely ignore. So we, you know, so, you know, when we're like, oh yeah, we care. Well, no, we really don't care because until you can really understand what's in your software, I mean, I, I recommend everybody that can, take a, just take a look. You know, run your Maven, look at some of these components, look at the release history. I bet you there's some stuff in there that, you know, you'd be like, ah, oh, I'm not quite sure. And then developer says, well, well, yeah, it works. We need this. Like, oh, do you understand what it does? Uh, maybe. Right? To me, the proof is in the pudding, right? We say we have a policy, right? But oftentimes, the policy doesn't even cover security. Because when we think of open source, a lot of people, the open source policy, the whole notion of having a policy on open source is started in worrying about legal concerns, right? We're concerned about IP risk. We're concerned about GPL licensing in our commercial software. Um, so when you think of open source policy or open source governance, it started as a legal movement concerned about legal risk, and it's about licensing. So oftentimes, like, oh, yes, we have a policy. The question is, well, does the policy even touch or even concern security? Nine times out of ten, it doesn't even, it's not even in the radar screen because we're so focused on do we have any GPL in our code? That's not the only problem with open source software. Not to say that you can't have it the other way, because the other problem is that it's not just a security problem. Right? It's a quality problem too. If I think about it long and hard enough, and I'll probably beat this like a dead horse, it's a problem of not knowing what you're using in the first place. And not knowing brings a level of risk, because there are better choices that you can actually make. Right? When we look at this, only 21% must prove that they are not using components with known vulnerabilities. This is not something that's hard. You can know what components you're using. You can know what vulnerabilities that they have. That does not mean that you've satisfied, are there any other additional unknown vulnerabilities? This is not a question of, well, the unknown, no, unknown unknowns. Right? But there is a series, a set of data that says, hey, this is a thing that you're using. It's nine years old. It's got a really bad vulnerability. You might not want to use it. Do you have a policy that says you shouldn't use that? I mean, it seems, kind of, it seems to me very basic. Even if, you're con even if you're a consumer of software, I've got software, I'm buying software. Wouldn't that be a really good question to ask? Hey, IBM? selling the WebSphere. Does WebSphere ship with any known components that have known vulnerabilities? Because, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we know the answer to that, but the reason why it does is because nobody's asking. If you don't ask, you, you won't know the answer, which goes back to, shh, don't tell. 
We really don't care. All right, what about the developers? Right, we know on average, even just Maven Central, a component is updated four or five times a year to fix known security issues or quality issues. Does anyone actually monitor this? I mean, it's very rare. I see, I actually, I'm, I've been doing some graphs and some analysis of, there are certain types of developers, certain types of organizations, one which sort of are fast movers. New version comes out, we're updating, right? Then they're the ones that are like, uh, yeah, I gotta like worry about all this other stuff. So lo and behold, fast forward a few years and you look at what you got and it's, it's pretty crufty and crunchy. Because we're not paying attention, right? It's so easy to type, you know, hey, I'm gonna add this dependency in my POM file. And then you do it once and you forget that you ever did it. Until, oh, well, really never. Right? Unless there's some new specific feature of that library that you're using, you're looking for, then you might update. But that's, you know, that, that's, that's the problem, right? That's the problem that we have, is that we really don't pay attention to this. We don't certainly look at vulnerability data. You know, I let talk to the average developer, like, oh, you actually look at, at CVEs? I know we got, you know, we got security guys. We did those guys to do that. I can't wait for the day that I no longer have a job as a security guy. Because security to me is a discipline that we should be working really hard to make it not our job. I think in some cases we spend a lot of time making it, hey, we, I'm the security guy, I have all the security knowledge and I'm going to keep that. Because right? that's what makes me special. The reality is, is that we don't scale. Look at this room. There's not enough of us. I don't know how many rooms across the country. I think you go to an average dev con uh, conference, you go to a room where they're talking about the latest DevOps agile thing, hundreds, like, like, they're like rats, rabbits that just come out of the woodwork. Right? You, go to the, you go to the hall, which is the, the security like, geek hall, and there's like 50, 25. Right? We've got this problem that we have to make sure that it's not our problem. It's a developer issue. We've got to make stronger development and realize that this is something that you can't be saying, no, that I don't care about this, I don't know about it, it's not my problem. We have to completely flip this kind of stat. Or otherwise, we will continue to fail fundamentally as a security industry. Because we don't scale. We never have, we never will. I mean, I used to joke, you know, some organizations you know, say, oh, you know, we used to, you know, that security training is important. And I, I think security training is extremely important, right? But it should be just developer training, not security training. We're not trying to make security folks, trying to make developers that can understand this, the, their responsibility from a security perspective. Because if you train them to become security experts in our current industry, it won't be long before they're not your developers anymore. You know, and I, I mean, I, a lot of these are really tongue in cheek, right? Well, so, well, at least, you know, at least, well, we know that it's all good in production. Production is not a problem, right? Does your organization maintain an inventory of open source components used in production applications? Some organizations, many of us, it may be lucky to even to understand what applications you have in production, let alone what's in those applications in production. Right, when we talk about this, you know, we, me, you know, the industry, we like to think of this as a supply chain problem. Software is a supply chain. We need to apply supply chain mechanics. This is not something new, nor is it rocket science, but we're not even taking the basic steps. We don't know where our stuff is, and we don't know what's in it. So when there's a problem, we don't know if it, one, we have the problem, B, where in all the places is that problem? And C, how can we actually fix the problem? Because we don't even know what we have in the first place. We, we, we struggle with, hey, this new CVE, Harpley comes, hey, you know, the, the CEO, somebody says, well, does this in, impact us? Someone, oh yeah, we don't, we don't have any of that, right? 
Then you go farther down the train. Eventually, you end up with some developers like, oh, yeah, we got that all over the place. Because somebody knows, but it's not, doesn't tra it doesn't transgress or, uh, across the entire organization. Right? A bill of materials, incomplete. Right? We don't have bill of materials. Bill of materials, fundamental thing. We need to start thinking about this. Our software bill of materials, what's in it? What do we have? What do we have when we're going to build something? What do we have when we're building it? What do we have when it's in production? What do we have? I think this is, it, this is the, I, as I sort of belabored that point a little bit earlier, right, is that we all point fingers. It's somebody else's responsibility. To me, when I look at this chart, it's because nobody really knows where the responsibility lies, right? Application development, I, I'm actually surprised by this, right? That 40% says application development owns this. Because I think if you were to talk to application development, they would say it's 40% is someplace else. Right, so I think this is somewhat biased by the title of the person that answered this question. That as you get more developers, oh yeah, no, this secure, uh, security guy, right? Oh yeah. You know, I mean, even, even our developers, right? You know, I work at a development organization. Well, like, hey, we've got this thing. Is it important? You know, hey, what's the, what's the proper way to fix this? And I'm, I, I will often be more coaching, be like, okay, well, here's some things that you could try. Here's some resources that you could go look at because I want them to own the responsibility that I'm not here to tell you how to fix something. You have to take on that responsibility to understand the ramifications of the decisions that you're making and the actions that you should be taking as a development organization. Not saying that this is a security thing and we got a security guy to do it. Because there's not enough security guys. So we think we've got policies. Are they doing anything? Right? This is, I love this, we don't need no stinking policy. What would I need that for? I mean, come on. I, I, yeah, policy, smallacy. I think part of that, part of that is because the way in which we think of policies. Right? Policies are things that are, are, are a bad word, or it's a spreadsheet, or it's a guy, or it's a thing that slows down the, our process. And policies shouldn't be that way, as something that, hey, we don't need one because we think it's a burden. We need to sort of switch it on and say, we need one because it's a, res it's a responsibility that we must bear as an organization that wants to strive doing better and building more quality software. And then I love this one, right? We have a policy, mmm, bacon. It's because we have a policy, but it's not really doing anything, right? You don't have a policy if you don't have any way of controlling it. Hey, yes, we've, you know, I mentioned the policy early on, uh, early on the deck. It says, oh, well, we, we don't really address security. So some people are like, oh, yes, we've got the policy, right? It's in the employee handbook that you sign, right? That we've all read our employee handbook. We know exactly what the policy is. I, you know, as a CSO, I've had to read the policy that we have. And, you know, it's like, oh, yes, you cannot drive and use a cell phone. That's in the policy. That's in the policy. Why is it in the policy? It's to protect the organization such that if I ever was driving with my cell phone was in a crash, they could say, hey, guess what? In the policy. Sorry, your fault. Policy is no good if it's just written down and nobody understands it, knows it, or follows it. We don't care. The problem is, is that it really is our applications, right? Hey, if it works, ship it, right? The reason I mentioned this is that components are like crack cocaine. It's like crack cocaine because we choose components for one reason, for its features and capabilities. That's why we choose something. First thing, oh, what does it do? Oh, it's log back. Oh, it's got all these great log features. Oh, I want that, right? Oh, right, it's this new, this new fangled library. All my friends are using it. Everyone's using it at Stack Overflow. And these guys at, at, at Facebook or these guys at Google, and I heard this thing, and I heard this, saw this talk, and it's like the greatest thing. And I want to be the next greatest guy to use the next greatest thing so I can be famous of the first guy to use the next famous thing because it's cool. It's, I, I, I joke about this all the time. I think of it like music and my daughter. Right? It's like, oh, hey, guess what? I just saw this new this band, and, and I think they're really good. My daughter, and the minute I think it's good, it's no longer cool. Right? That band is sold out. Software components the same way. Oh, these struts. Oh, yeah, they want VMware. I sold out. 
uh, you know, this other thing got really popular. I, uh, we, we need another DSL. Uh, do we? Do we really? I mean, how many DSLs are there? Like, oh, okay, JavaScript. Like, JavaScript's not bad enough. We need CoffeeScript. Well, HTML, well, HTML, we need Jade. And well, with Jade, well, we need Moustache. And, ah! I, I was joking with a guy back there. So I said, I, like, you know, I, like, woke up. I feel like I woke up and I was in a coma. And all of a sudden, there's, like, all this stuff. And, and I thought I knew a lot of stuff about a lot of different software languages. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, my God. Everybody's using something else, something you know, like, oh, I want to be the mustache template guy. And like, th and, I mean, to me, I don't even get CoffeeScript. I mean, okay, I get it kind of, but guess what? It's, you have to like compile it to JavaScript. So you write something so you can compile it to something else so that it's in the browser in JavaScript so you can actually like see what it is and, and, and debug it. So, so why bother? Do we, do we really need that? Now, I've just, you guys aren't probably developers, but maybe we should have a, this conversation over beer or something, because I, I, you know, I don't know. So what application training is available? You know, security thing is such a drag. It, you know, get me to the bacon. You know, oh, yeah, we got some e-learning stuff, and we do these things, and you know, we should be doing more, and uh, you know, bacon. You know, clean up on aisle nine. Right? We, it, we, we, we do so much, but not enough at, at scale. Right? Licensing is, is another issue. I've got a few more minutes, but I've, I, I've got to get to, to these. You know, I, I say, if you're going to look at something, look at things like these. I say this tongue in cheek, right? Because this is not about opponents being an apocalypse. It's not going to kill you. But you should at least have an understanding that you've got at least one of every single one of these in your application. First one is what I call the virus. Virus happens to be something that is used by everyone. I say this because this is an, another interesting thing is that look at these release dates, right? This CVE 2011, number of dependent components. What this means is that this particular component has n close to 9,000 other things which use it, which sort of begins to spread the seed. It's downloaded seven million times and being used by 72,000 different organizations with a CVSS score of 6.8. And I, I like that last line, right? Instance to execute arbitrary commands via the Java Lang runtime class. Probably not a problem. <laughs> and the mean time to repair. 229 days. What that 229 days tells you is that of these 8,781 other projects which use this thing, on average it took them 229 days for them to actually realize that it was a problem and fix it. So I say this is the virus because when I look at the mean time to repair, this is only one dependency leap deep. Each one of those 8,781 also have other dependencies, which have other dependencies, which have other dependencies, which may be the thing that you're actually using. Life of the party, you know, the guy who's got all the friends. This one I like because look at 2009. Right? Remote attackers, denial of service, malform, XML input, input. The interesting thing about these XML ones, right, is that, and I've noticed this, is older CVEs are written in such a way that they don't take, ed they don't, nobody really pays attention to them and updates them based on latest attacks. So I've looked at old struts, right? I've seen struts which were a 4.8 CVE. Oh, people are like, oh, I can't even get out of bed unless it's a 7. Sorry, 4.8. But because of the way that the OGNL works and the way that researchers took a look at that and, and, and looked at later vulnerabilities, that 4.8 really should be a 10 because you get remote code execution. But it was published years ago, and once it's published, it's forgotten. Right? There's really nobody that's paying attention to these things and saying, oh, let me go look at these old ones and see whether a new technique could really be leveraged in a different way. I mean, if I was a researcher and I wanted to like shortcut some of my work, a lot of these ones are pretty juicy, especially the fact that it's 120,000 different organizations being downloaded 4 million times. Hmm. Might be a problem here. 
you might be one of those 119,000. The forgotten. Let's not forget about the forgotten. Right? 2003. This is like the oldest CVE. And this is, read, let me read this thing, right? Processor version class and Java plugin 1.2 assigned applets. Who still uses that? 120,000 different organizations, right? Number dependent, you know, there are 75 other components which still rely on this. A CVS score of 6.8. I mean, I, you look at these, hey, guess what? These things are there and they're being used. I, I look at, you know, I, I, I joke, but I look at these all the time. And I'm, I'm still amazed, right? The undesirable, right? This one is a curious one because the undesirable is a, is a component which has no license. It's, you can't see it. It's not observable. It's not declared. It's just no license. You know what no license really means? No license means no rights. Because right, it's the license that gives you rights to use something. Right? So this is saying that, oh, well, not only at the last release date was in 2006, we're still seeing it downloaded and being a, a, a dependent on a lot of other different components. But hey, why, why should I care about these things? I love, I love the unproven. Eh? We don't really know what it is. It's the I am what I say I am. These are components which have a, a I, have, I want to say my license is one thing, but there's no way to verify that that license is actually correct. Right? When we look at components, we like to do a two-test verification. One is the component says it has a declared license, and two, you can actually observe what that license is, meaning you can look at the source code. Guess what? Source code is not available for this. So you can look at the source code and verify that the license in the source code matches what they said it was. Because nobody would ever say that it's one thing and have it not be that thing, right? Well, your guess is as good as mine. One hit wonder. Love iced tea. Right? One release ever. It's only ever had one release. I mean, really. Should you, do you really think that this is like a good thing to be using? Should I have components in my ecosystem that its last release was in 2005 and it's only had one and never had another one? I mean, does anybody even understand what this thing does? Oh, it says it's a regular expression parsing library. It's still relatively popular, but it's had one release ever. And the last release was, was 11 years, uh, well, no, nine years ago. My math is off. You know, these are things that each one of these seven, I guarantee you've got one of every single one in your software. Every single one. Very simply, you can begin to think about how do I organize, organize the way I build software such that these are very basic things that I can at least prevent. Hey, or I, I can at least ask the question, why are we still using this? What happens if there is an issue? Maybe if we really think that this is really important, maybe you should take a look at whether it's got a security issue because I guarantee you that nobody else is. Right? We like to talk about open source as the many eyes theory. Well, there aren't a lot of eyes looking. And if they are, they're certainly not telling. Of course, I've got like a minute left. What matters most? Part of our survey is we asked what people like to eat on their pizza. And I they were really upset that bacon wasn't an option. You know, and I realized that, and that's why I added bacon to some of my titles, because I realized that, that bacon is like, it's just like one of those things. The smell of bacon gets my son out of bed. We actually can, I can actually set a clock. My wife and I will like put some bacon on the pan. We could just set a clock, and like all of a sudden, he like comes down, like feigning, like he's like, oh, I barely cracked open. It's like, what are you cooking? I'm like, you know we're cooking. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be up coming down the stairs. I guarantee you that. And the other thing is that you know, we, we, at, we prefer beer over wine. I think there's a brew. We had the brew thing. I think we, we did the brew thing last night. 
I think there's a pub crawl, might be more beer tonight. I think that that validates the fact that we definitely like our beer more than wine. But beer and soda is going hand in hand. I mean, I used to joke uh, when I was younger that, you know, that we would always be, you know, the, the hacker is the guy that's, you know, got, a, um, you know, an ashtray full of cigarettes and a, and a bottle of Surge soda, right? Because we know that Mountain Dew really didn't do it. So we had to go for that little extra Surge. Um, but yeah, it's, to me, I think the interesting thing to sort of sum up, um, I've, and I actually finished on time, which is always a miracle, um, is that we, I'm glad that A9 came out. I'm glad that people are beginning to pay attention. I am still hoping for a lot more people to really start to care. Because if we don't start looking at this and how we frame the way in which we build and deliver software, and think about this is not something that we hope and pray at the end of the delivery cycle. I, mean, I, have, I have an entire different deck where I often talk about build as, a, as your build is a picture of the Willy Wonka's everlasting gobstopper machine. That's right. It is like all these dials and whistles and horns go off, and you ask someone like, "Oh, well, how did?" It's like oh, it's amazing how anything ever comes out the software at the end because you look at your build and it's a complete and utter mess. We can't know what's in our software until we begin to bring things. We talk about moving left, and moving left is not just about moving our security practices. It's also about moving our hygiene left of how we build and, and understand what's in our software. And with that, I'm open for questions or beer time. Yes? Uh, I was wondering, is something like Sonatype available for open source projects to actually use to analyze those things? These things are run by volunteers. They don't have tons of time. So yes, we have made Sonatype available to a, a number of open source projects. So if you have an open source project and you're looking for it, you, come talk to me. Yeah, so, so in the case of this is not just a Java problem. I have the most insight in the Java ecosystem, but I'm also right now in the midst of doing work for NuGet Gallery um, and as well as NPM. So I run an NPM mirror, so I'm in the process of collecting that same set of data for those other ecosystems. The problems are, are not distinct. The interesting thing is that, is that there are different problems in other ecosystems. For instance, one of them is NPM just started to add um, components that are idempotent. And those of, you, those of you that don't know what idempotent means, it means that when I say this version of this software, you know, this, this blob is version 1.2, you can't go change it at some later point in time and say, oh, no, wait a minute, I made a mistake. This is really 1.2. Right, well, until a few months ago, that wasn't NPM, meaning that you could have two different versions of software, different bits, be the same version. Bad, bad idea, right? That's not a good repo. We're in the midst of working with Microsoft, and NuGet is a little bit wild, wild west too, right? Because you could sort of throw up anything. I mean, it's sort of like, okay, I, I looked at this just the other day, and I was looking at jQuery. So some guy, right? decided that he wanted to have a new package of jQuery. So that guy got jQuery 1.7 or whatever it was and put it on NuGet. But the bits are different. So if you go, if you go to you know, the jQuery site, download 1.7, both the minified version and the regular version, they're different bits. Now it just happens that when you look at it, you're like, oh, okay, what really happened is that he compiled it with a different flag. but the reality is, is that, I mean, I, I look at some of the minified stuff and I'm like, uh, as, okay, I, I hope, right? We all kind of do this. It's kind of like, a, it really kind of makes me feel uncomfortable, right? Okay, here's the regular version, here's the minified version. And you're like, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop with this one and I'm going to hope and pray that this is the same thing. Because you look at it as one big line, variables, A, is like, yeah, it's got to be the same thing. That kind of, that sort of fundamentally kind of makes me uneasy. And the fact that you've got random repositories of some any old guy that can say, hey, this is this thing because I wanted to use, you know, in, in Mac OS, you've got chocolatey, right? Like, oh, I want to, I want to be the guy that's going to create the chocolatey package for this thing and call it this version. And, and well, is it really that version? Don't really know. So 
we are working on helping a lot of different repos talk about how do we build better and manage better repos, but that still is a ways off because these, I mean, it's moving at lightning speed. Other questions? Comments? I appreciate sticking in. It's been a really long day, but uh, I think I, I, there might be one more session left. If not, I think there's a, a beer crawl. I, I will likely be on it, and if you see me, I will buy you a beer. <laughs>